want to return uh, to a story, the Christian movement Jehovah Witnesses. They could be declared an extremist organization in Russia this week. That case is currently before their Supreme Court. Um, if you're with the program OS earlier, you will have heard a member of the group in Russia saying how difficult it was to practice. Um, let's talk now to Lloyd Evans, a former Jehovah Witness, author of the reluctant apostate. You're very welcome to the program, Lloyd. Well, let me start with the idea of uh, banning the group in Russia as the Russian government wants to do. What's your um, thoughts on it? Uh, hello, Nula. I think it's a terrible idea. Um, there are three main reasons why I'm opposed to the ban on Jehovah's Witnesses. First reason is human rights, fairly obviously. Everyone should be free to believe uh, according to their conscience. And for the state to say to a group of people, you're not allowed to pursue this particular religious denomination um, is a very scary step towards something that Orwellian would have, uh, that Orwell would have dreamed of. Uh, the second reason is persecution complex. I think that um, with Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of the uh, teachings and beliefs are oriented around uh, the, the Satan's world coming after them and this sort of action by the Russian authorities really kind of bolsters that kind of fear and paranoia. And the third reason is that, you know, by banning Jehovah's Witnesses, you're driving the organization underground and that makes a lot of the more uh, darker, more abusive practices harder to regulate. What are you talking about when you talk of abusive practices? Well, for example, um, men, there are many witnesses in my situation at the moment uh, who are being shunned by their Jehovah's Witness family members. This isn't something that's Why? happened. For, this isn't something that's happened throughout witness history. It's it's actually something that was introduced in 1981, whereby if you want to disassociate as a witness on conscientious grounds, you are to be shunned. Uh, the same way as if you'd sinned. So that's the situation I'm in now with my father. And as a result of that teaching alone, uh, I have a, a daughter who's going to be three next month and she hasn't met her grandfather yet. So these are things that have a real effect on people's lives. Um, the argument coming from Russia is that it would be an extremist organisation. Um, what was your... You mentioned some about when you decided to leave, what the reaction was. Why did you decide to leave? What was your experience of being a Jehovah Witness? Well, I, I left mainly because it just wasn't true that, you know, the religious teachings. I, I was baptised, by the way, I should say, when I was 11 years old. So I, I, I hadn't even started high school yet when I was baptised as a witness. And once you're baptised, you're kind of locked into the belief system. And it, as I say, it's impossible to leave gracefully. Uh, without disassociating yourself and making yourself liable to shunning. So just simply for taking a conscientious stand, um, I'm in a situation now where, as I say, my daughter hasn't met her grandfather and there are all sorts of ramifications. But you're in an interesting position in our last minute, Lloyd, because you still believe they should have that freedom of religion to practice pre wherever in the world. Precisely. My, my father may be shunning us, but the last thing I would want to see is him thrown into a jail cell. And the same extends to Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia. Very interesting. Different take on that story. Lloyd Evans, former Jehovah's Witness, also author of The Reluctant Apostate. The time in the London newsroom in the centre of London is just coming up to six o'clock. Thanks a lot for spending some of your day with OS on the BBC World Service. I'm Nuala McGovern. I'll be back with you again tomorrow. If you'd like to see where we broadcast from, we do have a Periscope feed. You can find it at BBC OS on Twitter. Get in touch with us, talk to us about the programme, perhaps some of the stories that are happening in your part of the world. And I'll be back with you again tomorrow. Goodbye. I know, how incredible was that? So yesterday there was um, a very strange turn of events whereby I ended up being asked if I could be interviewed on BBC World Service uh, Radio. Outside Source I think is the name of the programme. And it's all just to give you some, back, some background because you've just seen the interview, you might be interested to know how it all happened. Um, I wrote an article for Huffington Post and that came about because the partner, my YouTube partner program, they take a small cut of my YouTube revenue. Uh, one of the perks I'm supposed to have with them is uh, increased visibility on Huffington Post. 
And ever since I started partnering with them, there's been virtually nothing, well, there has been nothing showing on Huffington Post about my content. So just recently I started jumping up and down and, and saying, listen guys, this was part of the deal. I need to have, I need to have some kind of access to Huffington Post according to what I was promised in the beginning. And just a couple of days ago, I finally got a link through, which was an invitation to write as a contributor for Huffington, Bo Huffington Post. And what that means is you can basically write any article you like and it will automatically get posted to Huffington Post. The only catch is that they decide whether your article gets promoted, by which I, I consider that to mean whether it gets shown prominently on the website or not. And I think it has something to do with the search rankings as well. Anyway, I wrote my article, uh, why as a former believer, hang on, I'll show, you the, um, I'll show you the screen grab, why as a former believer I am against the ban on Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia, and you know, started sharing it and that kind of thing. And then yesterday, um, a BBC journalist starts tweeting me and saying, would you like to come on uh, BBC uh, Outside Source World Service Radio? To which my answer was yes. And there ensued a phone conversation where I was essentially vetted for the BBC because they wanted to find out whether I was crazy, I guess, <laughs> you know, what my background was. And I just assumed that they had kind of randomly uh, selected me. I mean, maybe they did. But what was interesting was while they were asking me questions, I was saying, well, you know, if you check out an article I've just written on Huffington Post, that more or less explains it. And she said, yes, we know about that. So that gives me some confidence that this is a good, um, a good avenue for me to get information out to the public. Um, about you know reasonable activism when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses. So long story short, I was asked to do this interview at, uh, it was actually 6.45 local time, 5.45 in the UK. I had to be ready, I was there on Skype, I had some cameras set up and it was an interesting process to be waiting to go on air because you're you're on Skype and you're hearing the program going on in the background and every now and then the producer will come on and uh, he'll say, hello Lloyd, are you still there? And I'll say, yes, I'm still here. And he'll, he'll basically prep you for the interview. And, and one of the things he said was, um, expect some pushback. Expect, he said, uh, you're going to be interviewed by Nula McGovern expect her to push back on some of the things you say because she has to maintain uh, impartiality. So I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, I, I can deal with pushback. So um, then the interview started and I was kind of, I had it in my head that I would be on for longer. And so the interview just happened so quickly. And before I knew it, it you see on the video, I'm, I'm almost a little bit bewildered that the interview's finishing so quickly because I kind of expected it to go on for longer. Um, but when I look back on that interview, I can't really imagine... Um, I, I can imagine it going worse, let's put it that way. I think that considering it was only four minutes or so, I'm glad with how much ground was covered. I'm glad that I was able to really explain the whole issue of shunning to someone who, if you look at the facial reactions, <laughs> clearly did not have a clue, or at least was pretending that she didn't have a clue about shunning. And actually, the interesting thing is that I couldn't see her facial reactions because it was only after the interview was, had ended that I went looking for the video, and the video's from Periscope. But the only thing, I, when I had my headphones on, all I could hear was the audio. And I could hear her trying to chip in. I could hear just little, her trying to get, get in a word edgeways. And, but I was just, no, I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to let you ask a question. So I was kind of barreling on with it. But actually, psychologically, 
I think if I had watched the Periscope feed while I was being interviewed, <clears throat> the, it would have been a different interview because I, I'm just that way inclined that if I can see someone is desperate to cut me off and, and with the facial expressions as well, I would have found that really, really distracting. So I'm glad I didn't have the Periscope feed on. And I just think that the, the interview is actually fascinating from the point of view of understanding the media's approach to Jehovah's Witnesses. Because, well, let me put it this way. There are, there are different, different journalists have different approaches to Jehovah's Witnesses depending basically on how much they know. So if you're a Trey Bundy or someone who's really done their research on Jehovah's Witnesses and you're being interviewed by that kind of journalist, and Trey and I have had uh, a number of conversations over the last couple of years. They're asking you questions and you're basically not encountering any resistance at all when you're explaining to them the, uh, the hurt and the pain and the harmful elements of Jehovah's Witnesses because they know already. You know, all, all you're doing is substantiating what they've already verified for themselves. That interview on, on BBC with uh, Nuala McGovern was a completely different experience, even just in terms of what I could hear her saying. It was like swimming um, against the current. It was like swimming upstream uh, because there was that resistance. There was that uh, assumption, just basic assumption that Jehovah's Witnesses couldn't possibly be that bad. How can, how can these lovely people who disturb you on a Saturday morning be in, have, be in a religion that is abusive? How could that possibly be? You're talking nonsense. So it was, it was really, I really felt as though that the difference, it was like wading through treacle. It was really pushing against this kind of invisible wall of misconception, um, which I actually think, I mean, I don't blame Nuala for it. I don't blame her at all. I think she was just reflecting her audience. What, what I was fighting against was not Nuala's uh, misconceptions about Jehovah's Witnesses, but the misconceptions of the public in general about Jehovah's Witnesses, which she was having to you know, represent as a journalist. So I found, I found the whole interview a fascinating insight into the challenges that activists like myself face when it comes to educating and raising awareness about um, abusive practices in Jehovah's Witnesses. Because when I make my videos or I write my articles, I'm essentially talking into an echo chamber, frankly, <laughs> because the, the vast majority of people who watch my videos know a thing or two about Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, even if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching one of my videos, I don't have to explain <laughs> that there is such a thing as disfellowshipping, that there is such a thing as shunning. You might resist the way I describe it. You might resist my take on it. But I'm not having to reinvent the wheel in terms of explaining that there are, that there are for example, people dying as a result of uh, refusing blood. Um, but it's different when you're speaking to someone who doesn't know about the religion and whose only knowledge of the religion is people disturbing them on a Saturday morning. That, there's a big, big difference. So I found the whole process of doing that interview uh, extremely enlightening. So that was all I really had to say on that. Before I leave you, I mentioned before about uh, my partner, Broadband TV, and them taking a slice of my ad revenue. Um, if you've been following me on Twitter and Facebook, you'll know that I am quite concerned about something that's called the YouTube Advertiser Boycott. Now, if you don't know what that is, just check it out on YouTube look at what's being said at the moment on the David Pakman show in particular. He's really, you, you can sense that David is very, very concerned about what's happening. Essentially, 
um, the David Pakman Show and many other channels that deal with real stuff and not just, you know, cats and makeup and toy reviews. Channels that deal with real stuff on YouTube are under threat at the moment. And I have to say, it's impacting me as well. So I'm going to show you now, uh, I don't want to go on about it for ages, but I'm going to show you a screen grab from my Google Analytics. And you can see that there's a, a dip towards the left where, and that dip is when I was writing my book. So when I was writing my book, I was only putting out the occasional video and the channel was just kind of ticking along. And the orange line that you see is views and the blue line that you see is revenue. So there I am just kind of uh, doing the bare minimum. And then around January, you see the views and the revenue start to pick up quite dramatically. And that's because I finished my book and I was determined to go back to focusing on my YouTube channel and focusing on churning out video content because the book was finished. That could just do its own thing. You, you, you write it, you publish it, and you basically release it and let it live its own life. But I want my focus to be, you know, my everyday activism to be making videos. And so I threw everything into making videos. And then you can see you know, the views and the revenue going up and up and up. And then just in the last two weeks, the revenue goes down dramatically in comparison with the views. So that essentially, as of this moment, the revenue is the same as it was when I was making no, no real effort with the channel, even though the views are higher. And I can tell you that you can see just at the end, you know, the revenue is kind of flatlining on the bottom. Um, those two days uh, or two or three days were about six dollars per day, um, which I mean, basically, it's not something I like talking about because I, I'd rather just get on with making content. But the thing you have to realize is that I am now a full time ex Jehovah's Witness activist. That is what I do now. It used to be only a matter of, um, well, basically before the book, it used to be that I had to balance my activism with my business in terms of doing translations for people. And every now and then I'll help uh, Deanna. Deanna is now taking care of that. My main focus when I wake up each day is activism. And I might help her out from time to time with proofreading something. But she knows that uh, if an email comes through and it's it's not to do with activism, it's to do with translation. It's it's her that it's she needs to worry about it basically. So what I'm saying is that the revenue that comes through from videos used to be very very useful because it it basically didn't require anything other than you to click off the advert or to or to click the skip ad button and just by doing that you know, in a way you were donating to my channel because the person who was paying for that ad uh, for that ad to appear had to pay YouTube and YouTube had to pay me. Now, YouTube isn't showing ads on all of the videos and um, you, you probably, you've probably already seen for yourself that it's kind of 50-50 uh, whether an ad appears or not and that's why the revenue's gone down. So as a response to that, uh, I'm, I've been absolutely humbled by the way, just by talking about it on Twitter and Facebook, already I've had 18 new patrons on Patreon who are basically trying to build my uh, Patreon income so that I'm completely insulated against stuff like what's happening with the advertiser boycott on YouTube. I mean, that is, that is just wonderful. If I could just be directly answerable to my patrons and to people who enjoy my, my content and not have to worry about nonsense that's going on behind the scenes with adverts, that would just be perfect. And I can't thank enough those who have already realized that and who are able, because not everyone's able, I realize that. But um, those that are able and who have responded Thank you, thank you, thank you.
So that's pretty much all I've got for you. I'm now going to go back to working on the rebuttal for the April 2017 JW Broadcasting episode, which um, I'm actually enjoying doing because there's not that much to deal with. It's kind of your kind of standard cookie cutter um, organizational video, but there's still some interesting stuff to talk about. So look out for that over the next week. And as always, thank you for watching.